happy to be joined by Dr. Beth Overmoyer and Dr. Stephen Keith, and we're going to be discussing how we extend engagement and think about protocol design to achieve research equity and patient diversity. Uh, just a few sort of brief opening remarks from myself. So no slides for this. This in, is intended to be an open discussion and sort of freeform dialogue between the three of us. Um, we obviously will be touching specifically upon protocol design and the experiences that we've had in thinking about this in a patient diversity setting. So by way of introduction, my name is Nick Kenny. I am the Chief Scientific Officer for Senios Health, a 28,000 person uh, development organization. And my particular interest in this is that I have the privilege to sit on our DE&I Council, um, particularly focused on patient diversity in clinical trials. So Beth, maybe I'll pass this to you for a brief introduction from yourself to the audience. Great, thanks Nick. My pleasure to be here. So I'm Beth Overmoyer. I'm currently a board member at Advara in the IRB. Uh, I recently retired from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in July. And in the Dana-Farber, I developed the inflammatory breast cancer program. I've been a clinical researcher in medical oncology and hematology for more than 35 years. And my clinical research focus has been in inflammatory breast cancer, and that is a disease that is uh, more frequently seen in uh, African Americans, uh, uh, Middle Eastern Americans, um, Arab Americans. And so my focus in clinical research has always been to expand diversity. Um, and so it's my pleasure to be part of this panel. Right, thank you, Beth. And then Stephen, maybe a little of your background for the audience. Yes, thanks an awful lot, Nick. And I'm very happy to be here to join this discussion. Uh, my name is Stephen Keith. I am a pediatrician by training and have been at Cineos Health coming up on five years uh, in the neuroscience group and uh, have responsibilities for studies across the range of neuros neuroscience uh, issues and, and diseases, uh, as well as in vaccines and some other areas. Uh, and also, uh, you know, along with Nick, been um, kind of trying to push the, the effort at Cineos Health uh, to make sure that we recruit diverse patient populations for all of our clinical studies. And so really looking forward to this discussion. Great, thank you, Stephen. So Beth, Stephen, I think we've all seen by now, you know, a wealth of data and information, whether it's directly from the FDA and their own data sets for drugs that have been approved, or whether it's at multiple publications in, you know, journals like New England Journal or JAMA, that there's a tremendous lack of patient diversity in the trials that have been conducted, particularly in North America, leading to new drug approvals. And from my own point, one, one example that really shone out was when the agency dissected back through the more than a dozen recent approvals of drugs in multiple myeloma. The African-American population was hugely underrepresented in that group. Obviously, a significant ethical issue with that, but also a significant scientific issue with that, that we're putting drugs out into the market, that we may not have appropriate information about how patients with that particular disease may be impacted if they haven't been fully studied. So Beth, maybe to start with you, what's been your perspective on some of the challenges we've seen? I know you and I talked earlier about immunotherapy agents, IO agents, and some of the, the egregious uh, lack of diversity in those trials. What has been your experience and how protocols in particular might have influenced uh, those outcomes. Thanks. Um, you know, as you stated, uh, the FDA really has approved uh, many medications in the last years uh, without really incorporating the population that, uh, that the disease is more common in. And in medical oncology, what we find is unlike infectious disease, for example, there's only 8% of the population of cancer patients who are actually enrolled in clinical trials. And there are, there are many reasons why that happens. I think, you know, one of the important concepts, as you state, has to do with clinical trial development. And that has to do with, for example, eligibility. That's one issue um, in terms of, uh, a lot of the eligibility, of course, in medical oncology is very restrictive because we are concerned about safety. And so when we look at eligibility, we have certain criteria that uh, 
I think we just place without, without thought. For example, body mass index. We often say that because drugs are often metabolized and we're looking at the metabolism of new drugs, uh, and so we need to make sure that we have a patient population that has a normal BMI. However, more than 60% of the United States, United States uh, population is overweight or obese. And so if we look at the metabolism of a drug in a normal BMI population, are we really applying that, uh, that information to the patients who are going to be taking the drug? Do we really have a good safety perspective? So I think that when we look at eligibility, we need to really broaden the eligibility for clinical trials. And that's also uh, important for, for diversity, because again, we don't wanna limit uh, the people who could become eligible for the clinical trials. Um, you know, it's interesting because you also uh, talked about uh, the consent process that in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, session. And, you know, one of my pet peeves has to do with just translation that, uh, you know, America is the, has the second largest population of Spanish speaking individuals. And yet oftentimes when we look at consents, they aren't standardly translated into, uh, into Spanish or there isn't a witness signature, for example, um, so that we could uh, involve people of limited literacy or limited English speaking. All of those things go into protocol development also. Um, so those are just some of the issues in terms of protocol development, let alone, let alone site selection, you know, mm -hmm. making sure that we actually have um, a, a site that's going to allow engagement from a diverse population. I mean, I, Nick, I can really go on. I can go on in terms of making sure that, um, that the population gets compensated, that the, the people who are actually enrolled into the clinical trial get compensated for mm -hmm. enrollment. Um, there are so many aspects of clinical trial development that, that need to be enlarged or broadened so that we can embrace a more diverse population. Yeah. So Beth, I would like to come back to that sort of financial aspect in a moment, if I might. But Stephen, you know, this is obviously something you and I have talk, talked a great deal about. But as you think about Beth's point to investigator and site selection and how different institutions maybe are at different levels of, shall we say, competency, cultural competency around diversity, What's been your experience as you think about that, that direct link from sort of health equity or the lack of health equity to treating physicians, to study sites, and how we, I think, need to think differently about how we interact with study sites and think about selection of investigators and, and opportunity for training? What's been your experience there? Uh, well, the first thing I'll observe is to pick up off of something that Beth uh, mentioned or kind of it came very, very close to. And that is the availability of, of, uh, of sites, uh, clinical research sites, to those patients who are, you know, it, it not traditionally been been recruited, i.e., you know, racial and ethnic minorities. If in fact the site is located uh, in a suburb of Chicago, for instance, I'll pick on my hometown, that is, uh, you know, maybe 25 miles from downtown Chicago, and there's no public transportation. Uh, it makes it a little bit challenging to get uh, to get patients who are in the city or from other communities uh, that may be adjacent, but there's no public transportation to get to those places. Uh, that that makes it quite difficult to recruit those patients. Uh, as well, uh, we talk about you know the site selection, and there's a lot of a lot of components to a definition of a site, but the primary one is who is the principal investigator who is going to sit on the other side of the desk and try to provide information to a prospective uh, subject uh, about the study and convince them uh, that this is important and an individual that that subject can trust. If in fact, you know, the, the, the PI, it, I'll just use the, the gross term of looks different, the level of trust goes down and there's a number of studies that have showed that uh, racial and ethnic minority patients are much more likely to agree to participate in a clinical trial 
if in fact the person providing that information, that initial information and making the ask looks like them. Yeah. And not just speaking Spanish, but really somebody who they can they can relate to. So these are just some of the issues that we see. Uh, and, I, and I think we've got to address a good number of them. There's no single approach, no single magic intervention that can immediately increase diversity. There's a number of things, uh, and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about uh, uh, some of the others. Yeah. No, I think that's a really fine point, Stephen, because, you know, although we're focused primarily here on protocol content, everything is joined up, right? Because if you don't have the right investigator representing the trial to the patient, if you don't have the right community outreach to the patient, if you haven't done all of these things and more, and the compensation part, Beth, I do want to come back to. But if we haven't done all of these things, then each individual, if you like, solution is going to fall apart. It has to be joined up correctly like a well-done jigsaw puzzle. Um, Beth, I, I want to come back to something you talked about um, as far as compensation. And then, Stephen, I do want to come back and think about protocol designs as it relates to accessibility. But, Beth, first of all, when we think about the cost for participating in a clinical trial and we look at the recent uh, Clinical Tr Treatment Act that came out in January that mandated all 50 states now have, through Medicaid should provide coverage. In theory, that has opened up clinical trials to another 40 million people who historically would have not had access. Two questions for you. One, do you think that the impact of that act has been broadly acknowledged Do people understand what it is? And secondly, do you think it will actually have the intended consequences of opening up clinical trials to people historically who couldn't afford to do this? So it's a very good question, Nick. Uh, I think I'm going to look at that uh, from two different levels. Number one has to do with the population that's now being covered by Medicare. And yes, I do think that it will open up uh, the accrual for older people, unfortunately. Mm -hmm and this is my bias, in the United States, we uh, still do not have a, a single payer program. Hmm. And so when we look at the United States population, 10% of the population is uninsured. So those are the people who this particular uh, you know, ruling will not uh, en enlarge their participation in clinical trials. So it's always good to move forward. I'm very encouraged that we can we can now broaden the Medicare population and it, to to be enrolled, but um, you know, still it's it's not perfect. So when we look at, and I'm going to bring it back to protocol design. When we look at protocol design, um, oftentimes uh, the protocol has the investigational drug that's being provided, but it's not providing, let's say, especially in a phase three trial, the standard of care, and that's where you know the insurance must provide that drug, in which case that that patient, you know, the patient who isn't insured or who has um, a, a poor quality insurance that's not going to cover that standard of care drug, well, they really can't afford to participate in the clinical trial. Uh, so that's, that's where insurance really comes into play in terms of allowing and, and, and broadening patient participation. That's separate, that just has to do with insurance coverage and coverage for um, all the co-pays for the, when the subject comes to the office for evaluation. Every single time that the patient goes for a safety check, they have to pay a copay if they have insurance. Uh, so all of those things go into, into effect when we talk about insurance coverage for protocol design. That's even separate from what Stephen was talking about, which had to do with, you know, do you, can you afford the transportation? Can you afford not uh, not going to work? Can you afford childcare when you're in the office participating right. in the clinical trial? What what kind of compensation is the the subject, the participant, uh, going to to have? Um, and that's even separate from compensating the clinician. Uh, right. who is who is spending a great deal of time, especially as Stephen states, if we really are able to broaden the site selection and we have community uh, physicians who are enrolling patients, you know, they're extremely busy and they really need to be compensated for the time to enroll these subjects. Yeah, no, I think that's well said, Beth. 
Stephen, I, I want to go, come over to you and think a bit more about the what I would say that is the portability of a protocol. You know, who can actually participate? I know you and your colleagues have spent a good deal of time in trying to bring in a look at every protocol we see, first of all, from a patient perspective and think about the burden. And then secondly, to look at the protocols and say, do we need to do all of these assessments in an institution? And can we do them remotely? Can we do them where the patient is so that people are not having to take time out of their day, maybe lose you know, financial compensation from being out of work if they're hourly workers or whatever. They may not need to arrange for healthcare. So trying to make those protocols I think more friendly, if you like, from a design aspect. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, you've you kind of hit on on those topics because, I mean, if if the protocol includes um, several different assessments, uh, be they neurologic function or you know a, a stress test plus labs, and so a visit really extends for four to five to six hours uh, mm -hmm. in the site, then that means that that individual subject is going to miss a day of work. And it's not only just the loss of, uh, uh, of whatever the hourly wage was for that time, but they may lose their job because they're just, you know, they're not able to, to consistently uh, come in for work. So that is a major uh, kind of disincentive if in fact the protocol requires that kind of complexity mm -hmm. and all of these different items. A lot of this can be done you know, by home health agency. And, you know, to make the visit much, much shorter where, you know, physical exam and other, you know, kind of in-person assessments are necessary. But on that topic of assessments, there's a good number of assessments that have already been validated for mm -hmm. virtual administration. Uh, so that's, that's not an excuse. So there's a number of things that we really do have to think about relative to the uh, reducing the burden of the protocol. As you characterize, and I think that's a that's a good way to describe it. Uh, it's, you know, we're asking an awful lot for people yeah. to take out time, if in fact they they already have a, you know, they're going to have a particular condition that's under study, and it's tougher than somebody who is completely healthy and only 22 years old uh, to participate. It's an awful lot to ask of them, mm -hmm. and while. These patients may want to participate in the study because they have the same kind of, you know, sense of doing this, you know, for an altru altruistic reasons. But if they just can't, uh, we've we've stumbled. We've we've not hit the mark. Yeah. No, I, I think Stephen, that's exactly right. And it's sort of reimagining that old term of patient centricity, right? It's often been bandied around. But I think when we look for that patient voice in protocol design it's important to recognize there's not one single voice for patients in a trial. Right. It's very different by what your status is, where you are, what you can afford to do, right? So everybody is different. And I think we need to have that breadth of patient voice in protocol design, not just one think tank that puts it together and we declare it to be good, right? So it is a, a sort of a different way of thinking mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. Beth, I want to come back to you for something I think that I've seen over the years, specifically in oncology is that you know for many years now we've been able to celebrate the development of some truly impressive targeted therapies right we've seen for example in melanoma you know life-changing uh, agents being developed and the same i think true in myeloma and, and in subsets of lung cancer those kinds of things mm -hmm. the thing i remember from an fda workshop is that you know the way that we develop these novel therapies is that people have to have failed multiple other lines of therapy before they qualify for the initial trial mm -hmm. of these new agents. And one of the things that shines out to me is that while even in some of those settings when the appropriate patients were being approached, they would screen fail out because they didn't have access to existing therapies. So they couldn't get into a novel trial design. Had you seen, I know you mentioned at the top of the talk about you know your work in breast cancer and the disparities that you see there. Had you seen that sort of concern impact the ability to recruit a diverse patient base? That is a very good question. I have seen that in the international population. Uh, and, you know, again, a lot of our FDA approved studies, um, I, I, my recollection is that about 40% uh, were uh, 
40% of the people who accrue to those studies came from the US. And there is a very large international population uh, mm -hmm. that are enrolled in the drugs that are now FDA approved. But contrary to, to what you have seen, what I have seen is that um, they, they, uh, they didn't have access to the newer drugs. Mm -hmm. And therefore they were eligible for specific, you know, phase two or even phase one trials because they've never been exposed to a, a component of a novel agent. Yeah, um, whereas in the United States, um, you know, especially at large academic centers and, and again, uh, a, a less diverse group of people, um, they have been exposed to to a lot of drugs. And so um, and so they didn't meet eligibility because they've already had exposure to multiple agents and multiple lines of, of, of therapy. So it's an it's a very interesting concept in terms of of access to standard, quote unquote, standard of care. Yeah. Uh, and again, I think, um, you know, going into different areas and getting a, a, a much more diverse uh, patient population may allow more individuals who are living in the United States to participate in these trials. At least that's been my experience. Yeah, no, Beth, that's actually a really good point. There's two sides to this coin, right? The one side, what you're describing is that people who are naive to novel therapies getting access to a trial, if we can get the trial to them, the flip side being that if the trial requires you to have failed those novel therapies, then you, you're automatically excluded. So it's a fine balance that I think mm -hmm. we have to think about when we design those things. Um, yeah, so question for both of you, and maybe Stephen, I'll start with you. I think one of the things you and I have talked a lot about is that I, I do feel like we are in a, a moment of sustainable and meaningful change when it comes to patient diversity, the COVID, pandemic has certainly fueled some of that and shone a bright light on some of the disparities. We've seen that, for example, in the Moderna trials where they stopped part of the way through and reimagined what they would do. Um, but one of the things I think we've all seen is that despite, frankly, decades of regulatory guidance and advice and industry interest, things really hadn't changed. I'm wondering, as you look at the most recent FDA guidance that is up for discussion right now, I think it's open for comment, that is the most prescriptive document I think I've seen from the agency in terms of requiring sponsor companies to submit a plan to show up at the pre-IND meeting or the end of phase two meeting and describe the demographics of the disease and how the sponsor company is going to address that and make sure that appropriate patients get included. Do you foresee that will actually drive a meaningful change given that it is, is a guidance without any statutory authority? <laughs> well, that, that's the key of what you, you know, you just said it is, it is guidance and um, you're right. It's been over several years. The first such guidance or encouragement from the FDA was in 1994 to say that, you know, for all NIA sponsored studies, you have to identify uh, race and ethnicity of participants. And since then, there have been a number of different uh, uh, guidances or encouragements or, you know, kind of, uh, inducements, uh, non-financial, uh, to be able to, to, to increase diversity. And yet, you know, as you, as you also pointed out in, you know, in, during the time of COVID, we still saw disparities in, uh, a mismatch between how many, how many patients were enrolled from particular populations and compare that to how many, you know, what is their representation in a general population? And while we are talking primarily about the U.S., <clears throat> this is not an issue that is uh, that we see only in the U.S. Because around the world, we're seeing the same kinds of things uh, from Western Europe to Australia, uh, where you know populations don't really match populations and studies don't really match the populations uh, in those particular geographies. Um, so it's it's really tough. Now, am I optimistic? I want to be hopeful that you know this particular the latest guidance coming from the agency that is so specific as to what should be done primarily the diversity assessment plans that outline okay what's your target for enrollment how are you going to get there what resources are you going to use i.e community resources trusted mm -hmm. partners etc uh, to be able to enroll those subjects 
but it's still, uh, you know, this is still advice, guidance, and hope for. And I think until we get to a point of uh, using the regulatory stick that is available uh, or that could be available to say, if you don't do these things, then you're not going to, you know, be able to either file or, yeah. or conduct the study. Um, we'll see. We'll see. I, I, maybe I'm, I'm a little more sanguine than you are relative to the industry finally yeah. acting, acting right. I don't know. Yeah. No, I, I think it's, it's true, Stephen. It is still a guidance. I just, I think from, from my perspective, I was encouraged to see that it was actually quite prescriptive, including, you know, asking people to describe, do you expect any PK or PD differences based upon, you know, scientific evidence that we've seen in different ethnic minorities? I mean, I think we're all completely, for example, nobody is surprised when we design different studies, for example, that have to be done specifically in Japan with Japanese origin patients, because we know exactly all the different metabolics that can go on with different drugs in that case. And everyone's totally good with that. And to me, to see the agency pushing that kind of idea into their plan development and their guidance, I think is a great first step to say, have you even thought about this? You know, what do you know? And I go back to an agency workshop on myeloma and some of the differences that were uncovered in those data mm -hmm. as a sort of fuel a sort of a fuel for that change. Um, Beth, I just want to switch gears a bit. I think we're sort of doom and gloom about all the things that haven't worked and haven't gone well. But can you think of any good examples that sort of would be like a shining light for people to, to go look at and think about following as, you know, there was an intentional design that achieved a good outcome that we should all look at and think about how do we, how do we make the most of that? What have you seen? Yeah, so, um, I, I do have uh, some optimism uh, about uh, the process. Um, I want to make one brief comment about the, the FDA uh, proposal, however. And, and I agree it is guidance and it's good guidance, but I think, I think seminars like this to really bring awareness to researchers and to companies uh, and to sort of the people who have the boots on the ground that it's necessary to increase diversity in the clinical trials, I think that that is going to go a much farther than the FDA guidance. So mm. I'm just very pleased that I, I think that that clinical research is moving in that direction. I'm very optimistic about that. Now, getting back to um, to the outcome and, and what sort of uh, fuels my optimism, um, there is a, a recent um, study on prostate cancer, looking at enzalutamide and androgen deprivation therapy versus uh, bicalutamide and androgen deprivation therapy, okay? And there have been three published studies, multiple published studies, but three recent published studies that showed that the combination of enzalutamide and ADT or androgen deprivation therapy is better. So what was very interesting was that a multi-institutional trial published last January, actually had a subset of patients who were African-American. So something like 41, 43% of the patients were African-American. So this was a predetermined subset analysis. Hmm. And as we know, in prostate cancer, uh, it is, it's much more prevalent in African-American males. And so therefore, this is a perfect example of how the trial, how the outcome of the trial will actually benefit the patients who are going to be using the, the medication. And what was interesting about this study, which is what I have found in my inflammatory breast cancer trials when we've been able to have a subset, a predetermined subset analysis, um, is that uh, overall, yes, enzalutamide and the ADT were superior but if you looked at the subset of African-American men, it was significantly uh, superior. So that the, the whole outcome of the study was actually driven by hmm. the response of the subset analysis uh, versus uh, the other population, which was again, primarily Caucasian, there was maybe a 10% difference versus uh, you know, almost a 30% difference in the African-American population. And so it can be done. 
if you think of the protocol development before you actually develop yeah. the trial, that I want to involve a subset of, of the people who actually um, are going to be at risk for developing the disease. So I was so thrilled to see this. Uh, I was so encouraged because again, I've seen this in the inflammatory breast cancer population too. get a predetermined subset of, of, of patients who need to be enrolled before the trial is, is completed. Uh, yeah. And that's, I think, how we can move the, uh, uh, the marker forward. Yeah. And so, Nick, before you get started, uh, you know, I, I'm Beth, I'm really glad to hear you talk about that because the, the epidemiology of the disease really should guide the targets for enrollment. Uh, if in fact, you know, if you use breast, breast cancer and, you know, you're looking at triple negative, well, that's much more prevalent by population in the African-American population. And if you did all of your enrollment uh, in, you know, the state of Washington, you'd have a tough time mm -hmm. uh, in, in doing that. So you really do have to let the data guide you and it is scientifically valid to do that. This is not something that's being driven by, you know, kind of a, a moral imperative or whatever to do the right thing. Yes, that's the case. But this is good science. Uh, and this is how we're supposed to, to take care of patients, uh, by using data as opposed to anecdote and moral. Yes, yes. And assuming that everyone is going to respond to the therapy in the same fashion. Right. Um, yeah. I, if it's okay, Nick, can I bring up yeah. one more point for Please. protocol <laughs> development Please. that that really uh, that really supports what you're saying, Stephen? Also, it, uh, both of you were talking at one point about the metabolic changes in these uh, subsets of, of patients, and and part of the protocol development, I think nowadays really needs to be um, a genomically driven uh, protocol base. We need to we need to incorporate how the drug is metabolized and we need to incorporate biopsies because in the in the next several decades the whole concept of diversity what is diversity is it ethnicity is it racial it's going to go away because we're all going to become one but we need to understand the genomics so we need to look at the disease from from the genetic standpoint and not what the host kind of looks yeah. like but what the host actually is Hope that yeah. makes sense. No, I, I think that's an excellent point, Beth. And if I can maybe try and draw together the, the great points that both you and Stephen have made, if we set aside the sort of ethical issue of, you know, equitable access to clinical trials as part of the continuum of healthcare, which is a, a big part of what we're talking about, if we set that to one side, in an ideal world, you should study every drug in the people that get the illness whether they are pink unicorns or they live in Greenland or they live in North Carolina, mm -hmm. we should be agnostic to that. It should be, what do I know, as Stephen said, what do I know about the epidemiology of the disease? Who gets this illness predominantly? Where can I find those patients so that my scientific investigation of this drug is valid? And then to your point, Beth, with the, the prostate cancer example, once you've got those data, tease them apart and what is it telling you? Right? Because if you have differential impacts in different populations, that may impact your prescribing pattern and how you think about sequencing of drugs and who gets what, where, when, and how. And in fairness to patients, that sort of targeted approach to people's individual care is exactly where we want to go to. So this is beyond, I mean, ethically, it's the right thing to do, but the science and the clinical treatment paradigms are really what should underpin how we think about developing our protocols. Very much so. And we you know, uh, pick up on one other thing that, that Beth brought up about understanding the genetics, uh, you know, that are related to particular disease entities. But we also have to be mindful of the influence of environment on that genetic, you know, the, the, uh, the genetics of that disease. Um, because, you know, issues related to uh, exposure to toxic, uh, you know, air and other other uh, chemicals uh, does have an impact stress has an impact uh, these are all things that kind of play into your uh, really understanding the disease and then therefore being able to to uh, to thoroughly evaluate the the impact of different therapeutics yep. absolutely sure absolutely
So, Beth, Stephen, I think we're coming up close to our allotted time, but any closing remarks for the audience as you think sort of holistically about intentional protocol design? And Beth, maybe I'll start with you. Sure. Um, so what I would, I guess, one of my take home messages uh, is that when we design the protocol and Stephen, I'm just going to reiterate what you said, you know, design the protocol for the population who will receive the drug. Uh, that's key, but also don't reflexively say this is a phase one or a phase two protocol where everyone has to be seen weekly and everyone has to have X number of blood draws and everyone has to, um, you know, have a normal BMI and et cetera, et cetera. Think about broadening the eligibility, broadening the, uh, the intricacies of that study, making it less intricate. And, and just think if you were the patient going through this protocol, how would that affect your life? And would you be able to do it? So uh, that I think is step one, just in terms of, of protocol development, uh, let alone site selection and, and allowing the patients to, uh, to be uh, uh, compensated for participation. Yeah. No, I think excellent point, Beth. Stephen, from your perspective, closing thoughts? I think closing thoughts would be, you know, the we've talked about the protocol, and that is certainly a component that has to be uh, done right to be able to have a successful clinical trial, any, any successful trial. Uh, site selection, I would say, you know, don't, we have to get used to going to unusual sites to be able to access certain populations because, you know, we're, we're talking about you know, in this instance, primarily racial and ethnic uh, 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 populations. But, uh, you know, the, the same kind of issues come up when you talk about people who are living in uh, out in the middle of nowhere, Idaho. How do we get them involved? Because those patients should be able to benefit from those studies. And we should reach out to them uh, because it's an opportunity for us to better understand uh, those particular therapeutics. Um, and so there's there's a lot of different things there is, again, I'll come back, there is no one thing to do. There's no one intervention that solves this, just as there's no one intervention, you know, to, uh, to prevent COVID infection. Uh, and that's, that's a lesson I hope all of us have learned. Immunization does help. Masks do help. Staying outside of, uh, you know, kind of crowded spaces where there's you know, people who may, in fact, have the virus and not know it, that does help. So we've got to use we've got to use multiple uh, approaches to be able to uh, improve diversity in studies, to better understand the drug, uh, and to do our jobs. So, Stephen, Beth, thank you so much for your time to have that. I think really good dialogue about not just protocol design, but everything that wraps around it and the integrated approach we need. Uh, I want to also thank the folks at Mass General Brigham for giving us the opportunity to have this discussion. And I wish the audience well and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>